Well, thank you all for making the journey outside on this snowy day. Really, really appreciate you taking the time to be here. We have a full crowd, and it speaks to how well loved Sharon Salzberg is in the Charlottesville community. So, Number welcome. Six. Thank you. Sharon. Thank you. So we are going to be together for the next hour and a half or so, and, and the way we're going to structure this evening is um, Sharon and I will have a conversation. I have some, some questions I'm going to pose to her, and we're just going to engage in an informal kind of conversation, and then we'll have some time to open it up to questions to, to, to all of you, and we'll have a, um, some mics that are going around. And I'm going to begin with some housekeeping. So um, first I want to say that I'm Susan Bauer Wu, and I am president of the Mind and Life Institute. Sound? OK. Uh, which is a um, global nonprofit that is based here in Charlottesville. We moved here about two years ago, and we're doing lots of fun work, so I encourage you to learn more about Mind and Life. You can check us out online or talk to me or any of our team. And I've been here in Charlottesville for about five years and really, really love this community. And it's people like you that make me feel really blessed to be part of a community that cares about not only one another, but really cares about things in the world. And we have this, um, this grounding in love and in real love. And it's, um, this to me will be an opportunity for us to continue to look at ways that we can come together to learn and grow and make our community even better and stronger. So, this is part of Virginia Festival of the Book. And so on behalf of Virginia Humanities, and the, which is the producer of Virginia Festival of the Book, and special acknowledgement to the team of Tori Talbot, Jane Kulo, and Sarah Lawson for their hard work in making Virginia Festival of the Book possible. So let's thank them. <laughs> also would like to acknowledge Unity of Charlottesville for hosting us and allowing us to be in your absolutely beautiful space here. So thank you. And would like to remind everybody to please silence your cell phones if you haven't done so already. And feel free, and I encourage you to tweet about this event, hashtag VABook2018. And uh, warm thanks, huge thanks to the sponsors. Um, and the community partners who um, have made the festival possible, and the ones who are specific to this event include Insight Meditation Community of Charlottesville, the Compassionate Care Initiative at the UVA School of Nursing, the UVA Contemplative Sciences Center, and the Mind and Life Institute, all um, sponsors of this evening. So with regard to supporting the festival, yes, the Virginia Festival of the Book is free of charge, but not free of cost. So please remember to go online for information on how you can support the festival and help it to sustain for years to come. Also, there are evaluations that we strongly encourage you to complete. The, Evaluations are, um, can be completed online, and so if you leave early and don't complete it here, please complete it online. And book sales, yeah, this is a, um, a book talk in a way. <laughs> However, we don't have books for sale 
because of the weather. So the UVA bookstore was providing the books. So we're very, very sorry about that. If you have books um, that you brought with you, we will have time that you could sign afterwards. And I trust that Sharon will be back in town here, and so you can bring your book next year and she'll sign it. Now it's a karmic debt you know, <laughs> <laughs> to come back. Maybe not in the winter. <laughs> this is when does winter, winter end? <laughs> today. Today, thank you. <laughs> yes, two days ago, yeah. Well, we heard that March is the new February. Oh, somebody who said that? that? Somebody <laughs> said that. I heard that yesterday. Oh, dear. <laughs> <laughs> so, with um, no further ado, we'll, we'll begin. And actually, before we just jump into a conversation, I just want to encourage you to just drop in and maybe just take a few breaths or just be aware of the wonderful company around us in this beautiful space. Reflect on your intention for being here and making the effort to be here on this, this snowy day. So Sharon, Yay. it's a great honor to introduce you. So I'm going to give you a little formal intro. All right. Okay. So Sharon, Sharon Salzberg is a highly regarded, well-loved meditation teacher. And you have students and friends and fans all over the world, including here. And you've been teaching for 30 years. Oh, older. much more. Much more. No, it's true. I'm that older, that much older than when that was written. <laughs> <laughs> Whenever that was written down. <laughs> She's been teaching a very long time, for, de for decades. And Sharon's written a number of books, and um, New York Times best-selling books. Most recent book, um, or some of her most recent books is Real Happiness, Real Happiness at Work. And one of your earlier books that's a real classic is Loving Kindness, and many others. And she continues to be incredibly prolific, traveling all around the world teaching, and also um, participating in podcasts and blogs. You part of Krista Tippett's On Being column, um, the month of February, you have the mm -hmm. challenge, the real happiness challenge, with meditation mm -hmm. every day. It goes on and on. I don't know how you do it, <laughs> but you do it. And we're cont we continue to um, all benefit from your wisdom and everything that you, you share. Thank you. Yeah. And your earliest um, contribution, I think, was the founding, not the earliest, but one of the most mm -hmm. important in your mm -hmm. career was the founding of the Insight Meditation Society in, in Barrie, Massachusetts, mm -hmm. which continues to thrive and to um, be a haven for many people. So, thank you. Yeah, thank you. And you're also a Mind and Life Fellow and have contributed to our programs mm -hmm. in many ways throughout the years, and I'm, I'm very grateful for that. So just to begin, Sharon, um, what is to find love? To find love. Oh, that's such a problem. Um, I actually, uh, well, it was a long trajectory, you know, to get to the place where I wanted to write a book on love. I was, have been teaching, as many of you know, a loving kindness meditation, which is its own distinct method for a very long time. And 
the term loving kindness is the common translation of a word from uh, the Pali language, the language of the original Buddhist text, metta, M-E-T-T-A. And I've always felt a little bit funny about loving kindness as the translation, even though it's the word that I use, because it just seems to me a little bit um, formal or arcane, or you don't necessarily go to a cafe, for example, and overhear the conversation at the next table being about loving kindness. Um, and so my concern was that it might make the quality itself seem removed from day-to-day -day life and kind of precious in the negative sense of the word. And then I've had scholars and translators say to me, just say love. Stop being so cutesy about it. You know, you mean love, just say love. But that's always appeared as such a complicated term. It's like, uh, you know, I love that light fixture or I love you as long as you love me in return and the following 15 conditions are met or I love myself as long as I never make a mistake. And, you know, so what do we mean by love? And uh, I finally just decided to try to explore it. So the literal translation of metta is actually friendship. And I found I had some difficulty with that as well because to me, friendship implies kind of conviviality, like let's hang out together, let's go to the movies together, let's spend time together. And metta is really, a, it's like a freedom of the heart um, that is not mandating a certain action. It doesn't mean that as you say, experience love, loving kindness or love for this person, you're gonna say yes, or you're gonna give them money, or you're gonna uh, not protest their behavior. Or, you know, we tend to think that it must imply a certain kind of action and it really doesn't. So I think of, of metta these days or love as connection, as a, a profound acknowledgement of how connected our lives are, which uh, may not look so sweet in its manifestation or so um, compliant in its manifestation. So, the book is called Real Love, The Art of Mindful Connection. And so you, you have been teaching about this for, for many decades, mm -hmm. and why this book now? Um, I uh, was in conversation with a publisher, uh, who was a friend of mine, and I basically wanted to write a book that is uh, more or less encapsulated in the third section of this book. Um, the book takes us on a trajectory. Uh, the first section is all about love for oneself and how that isn't narcissism or selfishness, but really kind of like resource building. And the second section is love for an other, whether it's a friend or a partner or a child or, or whatever. And the third section is about love for all beings and how that's a strength and not a weakness and how that can be the source of a tremendous movement to try to seek change and, and so on. So I basically wanted to write that third section. And I, I talked to the publisher and I said, that's what I really want to write. And he said, no. Uh, he, he wanted a kind of more comprehensive book that included the personal relationship part so, so that's what I created. Thank you. Until tomorrow, when <laughs> I signed the contract for the book I actually did want to write. So, <laughs> so next. yes. So, so the first part of the book is about love mm -hmm. of self. Mm -hmm. So, what do you think are the greatest barriers to love of self in our society today, and what are the, the costs associated with that? Um, I think that there's, there's a certain way in which it's almost not uh, so permissible. <coughs> um, I, I think that uh, if you hear the way people respond, say, to the notion of self-compassion, uh, which is really self-compassion in, in distinction from 
self-esteem is not a time, you know, self-compassion is not what we reach for in a time, time of triumph or accomplishment. We don't think, you know, I learned how to play tennis today. I need some compassion for myself, you know. It's when we've blown it, we've made a mistake, we've strayed from our deepest aspiration, we've gotten lost somehow. That's when we need compassion for ourselves. And I've seen over and over and over again how people see that as laziness, you know, and, and just not caring about excellence and losing standards and kind of losing one's edge. And, and I talk about meditation practice as a template for developing self-compassion because there, more than almost anywhere, we see moment to moment how we're letting go and having to start over. And we need to forgive ourselves and come back. And you sit down with the intention maybe to settle your mind on the feeling of the breath. And then it's, it's not 7,000 breaths, you know, it's one breath and then you're gone. And then you're always letting go and coming back. And, and that's a model for doing that in life because that's the way to make progress. And that's the way to learn something. And that's the way to make a change in one's life. Because what I say at this age is nothing in life is a straight shot. You know, we're always going to have to like pick ourselves up and start over and start over and over and over again. People say, that's just like losing it. You know, that's, that's just being lazy. And it's such an incredibly self punitive attitude. And I'm counting on the research actually coming along to, to say, well, look, you know, it's not what you think. It's actually uh, moving toward excellence in, in a better way. So you mentioned the research and, you know, there's growing body of research as it relates to compassion. Yeah. And we're looking at the, the benefits of, of compassion, both for individuals as well as within um, society. How do we cultivate compassion for ourselves and for others? Mm -hmm. um, I might even ask you about some of the research. We can have a real dialogue. Um, I would consider uh, love, that power of connection and compassion, um, which we would define as um, the trembling or the quivering of the heart in response to seeing pain or suffering. So it's a movement of the heart and it's a movement toward to see if we can be of help. And this, by the way, is, is different than a movement into to just burn up, right? So um, it's a movement toward to see if we can be of help. And uh, from the point of view of kind of meditation training, love and compassion are like emergent properties of the way we pay attention. And we know attention can be trained because that's exactly what meditation is. And so it's not the same as sort of reaching for um, an emotion and demanding we feel it and trying to cover over everything else and, you know, clinging to it. It's not like that at all. But learning how to pay attention differently will do what we need to do to have these, these things emerge. So if you look at my website, for example, um, there's a, an extremely cute animation. Uh, there are a couple of them. One, I really... Uh, they're both great, but one I think is just the cutest thing in the world. Um, they're made by Happify.com, this company. <laughs> and what they had me do is go into a studio and just tell some stories. And then they made these two animations out of two stories. Well, the reason I like this one so much is because every character in this story is, is a dog. So you see this dog's mouth move and my voice comes out of it, which I just think is like so cute. Um, but this is basically the story, more or less, and it's about just this question. Um, I live in Massachusetts, but I've long had different sublet apartments in New York City. And this was like two sublets ago. I was living in a certain neighborhood, and I had a writer friend who was also living in that neighborhood. And one day he showed me this manuscript he was working on. In the manuscript, he wrote about going very often into this particular corner grocery store and pretty much always seeing the same woman working behind the counter whom he had like stopped looking at or paying attention to long before. 
And he realized he had like a vague, vague sense that maybe she was a little bit unhappy or slightly grim, but very vague that he was really completely indifferent to her. And the way he put it was, for all I recognized she was a living, breathing human being who wanted to be happy just like I do, she might as well have been a cash register with arms. And he was so shocked at the way he had objectified her that he decided he was going to go in there and he was going to pay absolute, complete attention to her. So he did that. And he said the first thing he noticed was that she was singing along to something playing on the radio and she had an exquisitely beautiful voice. So he said, wow, you have an amazingly beautiful voice. And she lit up and she gave him this big radiant smile. So I was reading that and I thought, oh, I, I go into that same store all the time too. And I know the woman he's talking about. I don't really pay any attention to her either. <laughs> Except I had the vaguest sense that maybe she was a little bit unhappy or something like that. So I thought, okay. It's like too weird to go in the store and say, I read you have a really beautiful voice. Because it's like, you know, <laughs> what's that about? But I could go in there and say, I heard you have a really beautiful voice. Because that kind of thing might have come up in conversation or something. So I thought, okay, I'm going to go in there and I'm going to say to her, I heard you have a really beautiful voice and her somewhat grim and unhappy countenance is going to light up and she's going to give me this big radiant smile and I'm going to make her so happy. So I went into the store and the first thing I noticed was she already looked perfectly happy. <laughs> and I thought, oh, all right. And, and I realized like I had not a clue who she was. Like, Maybe I saw her once looking a little bit unhappy and I froze her. And then I just didn't pay attention to her again. And once I started paying attention to her, there was that understanding of connection. I don't know the details of her life. I don't know her story. But something really shifted. right? And when we do that in the particular uh, flavor of opening to someone's vulnerability, to the recognition their potential for suffering exists, then we call it compassion. When we just do it, you know, as, as like, oh, here we are. Uh, everybody actually wants to be happy. We all <clears throat> want some sense of belonging, right? And it's so confusing. Like, how do you actually find happiness given everything we're taught and, and the wealth of myth, you know, we sort of, have absorbed and here we are together. So it all comes from paying attention. Wow. Do you think that in order to be really compassionate, that it's essential that we connect to our own suffering? Mm -hmm. I do. I mean, um, as I'm sure you know much more than I about the kind of the latest research uh, distinguishing empathy from compassion. So um, in that model, uh, you know, empathy would be like a, a necessary but not sufficient condition for compassion to arise. Empathy being almost like the first part of the definition that I gave. The, you know, it's like the quivering of the heart. It's the um, the responsiveness, <clears throat> you know, that felt sense of, oh, this is likely what you're feeling, something like that. And then there's the movement toward to see if we can be of help, but that doesn't always follow. You know, maybe we genuinely have that moment of empathy and we freak out, we're frightened. Or we sense someone's suffering or difficulty <clears throat> and we are exhausted, depleted, overcome. We feel shattered, we feel broken. We don't have it in us, we feel, to move toward. Or, or maybe we're blaming. You know, I, I was talking to a therapist, not here, I should say, in case you start to worry. Um, <laughs> I was talking to a therapist in another place who told me, you know, I find myself blaming my clients a lot these days. I listen and I think, I told you six months ago <laughs> what to do, you know? So maybe we go there or maybe we get into that kind of strange, egotistical thing of like, I am going to fix you. I am going to save you, right? Or we have the compassionate response, which is one of many possible responses to that felt sense of empathy. So in order to even have the empathy, 
<clears throat> to begin with, we, I think we do need to be in touch with our own suffering. Otherwise, how is it going to be the resonance? Um, and the more we deny it and we um, <clears throat> try to push it away or we, we find it wrong, I shouldn't be suffering, um, it means I've lost control, the less there's going to be empathy and then the less there's going to be the, the basis for the compassion. Yeah. yeah, that makes sense. So you talk about micro moments. Mm. So let me elaborate on that a, a bit and how each of us can seize opportunities to experience connection. Mm-hmm. Well, rather than thinking of love or, or loving kindness as um, <clears throat> the structure of how a particular relationship will evolve, um, I consider it more that, that moment of connection, which might manifest in all kinds of different ways. Um, it could be uh, that something in terms of real friendship comes from it or not. Maybe it's just a moment. And I keep using this example of, um, because I grew up in New York City, and uh, as I was growing up, the sort of um, custom was that if you get into an elevator, you don't look at anybody, you don't talk to anybody, you don't smile at anybody. You just kind of spin around and you stare at the door. And if you're lucky, there's some lights or something you can look at, but it's just not right, you know, to relate. And, and now, you know, sometimes I'm in the elevator in my building and somebody starts striking up a conversation. And I always have this kind of visceral initial <clears throat> reaction, like, what do you want, you know? <laughs> and then I remind myself, it's not going to cost you anything, you know, just get there. Maybe I have no one else to talk to. Think of that, you know? Just, just be present, just arrive in that way. And I was, I was using that example, you know, like uh, with a stranger, you know, or we, we are engaged with, in conversation with a stranger and we're not really listening. We're thinking of our email and everything else we need to get done, who else we'd rather talk to and why are they talking to me to begin with. And, and somebody I was speaking to said, well, you know, it's a lot like that in a long-term relationship, too. <laughs> they said, you know, you just stop listening. It's like, I, there are no more surprises left. I know the jokes, you know, like, nothing's new. Um, but every time we stop listening, we have broken that avenue for connection. So uh, rather than thinking it's got to look a certain way or evolve a certain way, I think about that moment because that is so accessible to us. Um, you know, we're a million miles away, we can come back. Uh, we see we're holding an assumption about this other person. We can actually put it aside for now and check it out through kind of direct experience. Like, is it really true or not? And so it, it's very empowering to think of it that way. So there are literally countless opportunities for these micro moments of connection. Yeah, it's every moment. Every, every moment, every day, yeah. So in the, the last part of your book, you really put out this call to action. And it's a call to action mm -hmm. to expressing love in the world, right? So. What are your, your thoughts on how we can be bridge builders in our community to live that, that call? I think, first of all, it's actually owning it. Um, another route, when you asked me how this book came about, I could have told you another story, which I know will, um, uh, which is uh, maybe 11, maybe 12 years ago, there was a movie called Dan in Real Life which my goddaughter actually had like a minuscule part in. She didn't have any speaking roles, but she barked <laughs> because she was really little. And um, there was a talent show in the, in the movie, and that was her audition, <laughs> was to bark. So she did bark. Um, 
But anyway, so in the movie, there was a line that I found very impactful, which was, love is not a feeling, it's an ability. Love is not a feeling, it's an ability. I actually got into some trouble with an editor over that who said, of course it's a feeling. And I said, well, yes, of course it is a feeling. It's a feeling we may yearn for more than anything or, or whatever, but what about thinking of love as an ability? Because when we think of it as a feeling, it's almost like a commodity. And it also usually is thought of as in someone else's hands to bestow upon us or maybe to withdraw and then leave us with nothing. You know, so it's really up to that other person or people whether we feel we have any love in our lives or not. And I realized it was like the image that keeps coming to me is like the UPS person standing at my doorstep, like looking at the package of love and looking at the address and saying, I don't think so, and walking away. And I'm like, wait a minute, then I have nothing, right? And in contrast to that, if we think of love as an ability, it's inside us, it's ours. And other people certainly might ignite it or inspire it or threaten it, but it's ours. The other side of that is if it's our ability, it's also our responsibility. And if we want love in a conversation, maybe we have to bring it in. If we want love to be present in an encounter, maybe it's up to us, you know, rather than, than someone else. And so uh, I think that's kind of crucially important, you know, that we feel empowered and um, inspired in that way. But you also have to, you know, that all comes from feeling love is a strength and that it is a power all in itself, that it's not going to um, just be like sentimentality or something gooey or being conflict avoidant or covering over a painful feeling or something like that, that it is a force all in itself. So um, our community here is continuing to heal from what we experienced last year, mm -hmm. um, being put out in the, the spotlight of the violence and the extremism. So what um, suggestions do you have and, um, and maybe specific aspects of your book that can be helpful to us as we live with, deal with, move on from these feel mm -hmm. this feeling of pain and sorrow and even divisiveness? Um, you know, well, I mean, there's something that um, I think is often not thought of in in an examination of love, which is also a kind of clarity of purpose that can come from that. And um, what I took from what happened here, because it frightened me, you know, and I saw a level of fear come up in me that uh, was unusual, um, was that even as I am convinced that coming from a place of love or compassion is powerful and important, that the way it needs to manifest um, is in almost like um, in action, really, in a kind of a, a, a sense of, okay, if we're all in this together, um, maybe I need to be protecting somebody or maybe I need to engage in uh, really politics, which is power, you know, so that um, the people I feel that are harmful and uh, really damaging don't have the power to really hurt uh, people, you know, so. Um, Say that again. Yes, I'll try. Uh, <laughs> You know, so even as there's a movement towards civil conversation and listening and reaching out, which I think is crucial, um, I also think there needs to be a way in which, to, in whatever way one feels moved to, 
to kind of engage in trying to do the good that's in front of you, even if it seems very small. And the reason I brought up politics is, is not to have a political debate, but if you feel that um, there's certain people whose actions and whose vision of life is really destructive and really harmful, um, and uh, they are moving toward having greater and greater power, then I think it behooves one to see if you can stop that trajectory, you know? So their vision of life is, is not going to destroy many lives um, along the way. And uh, to engage in, in whatever makes sense to you so that um, it's real life, you know? It's not just thinking about... Thanksgiving would go a lot better if I could sit and tolerate, you know, my uncle, who's I've always found to be sort of unpleasant and who now has views that are so different than mine. Um, that's also true, and, and I think that's great, but uh, I don't think at this point in this world it's enough. And so, you know, these huge meetings I'd go to in New York about... Uh, Shame, you know, move your anger into action. Um, don't just sit there and fume, you know, or uh, despair. Like, help somebody, help one person. Or, um, I have, I said um, politics also because I have like a fixation on people voting. And uh, I was once doing a program with uh, this congressman from Ohio, Tim Ryan, about mindfulness. But all I kept saying to people was, you've got to vote. You've just got to vote. I'm never tell you who to vote for, ever. But you just have to vote. You have to be part of you know, the process um, because that's what will make a difference in people's lives. And at one point, Tim looked at me and he said, are you running for office or something? <laughs> and I said, no, but you are. <laughs> you know? Um, you know, I think it's the action. And if that totally turns you off, it doesn't have to be that. You know? but, something that, um, so that you feel you're actually doing whatever you can to make a difference in, in people's lives. And I think it's important. Yeah, it is. So how does real love exist in situations of conflict? I think it, it actually does. I wrote another book, I co-wrote a book called um, Love Your Enemies with Bob Thurman. And, uh, in that sense, love does not mean liking somebody. It doesn't mean wishing them to succeed. It, um, it might mean I'm going to fight you with everything I can. But it's not that kind of sense of hatred or um, you know, that objectification. It's, uh, and what Bob used to say, because people used to challenge us all the time, was he'd say, of course you want your enemy to be happier. If they were happier, they'd be so much less of a jerk. <coughs> You know, they'd behave so much better. And I was once on a panel in Berkeley not too long ago, and um, it was a, a number of Tibetan teachers, one of whom had just left Tibet like that week. And um, you okay? It sounded like me. You just came from India. That's the India sound. Um, poor thing. Um, I told her I was watching the amazing um, tapes of the dialogues. Uh, and I kept thinking I'd get bronchitis if I were there, you know, so it's better to be here um, for me. Anyway, so, um, you okay, really? Yeah, okay. <laughs> um, it really does not mean liking somebody, but there is a certain sense that we know from our own experience that when we lose it and we're harmful and we lash out and we, you know, we're reckless. Uh, there's a beautiful statement of the Buddha's where he said, if you truly loved yourself, you'd never harm another. If you truly loved yourself, you'd never harm another. And as we recollect in ourselves the things we may have done or said, we can feel how um, disconnected we were at the time and whatever. So anyway, I was on this panel and this one Lama had just left Tibet like three days before or something. And um, someone in the audience stood up 
and he basically said, I really understand that when somebody acts in a way that's harmful, they're coming from a place of pain. But my problem is they don't look like they're coming from a place of pain. <laughs> they look extremely self-satisfied. They're having a fine time, you know? And he said, I don't know how to get there. So like nobody on the stage wanted to answer him. So finally I did, you know? And, and I said, I really agree with you. It's like, it's immensely frustrating. And you keep thinking, you know, couldn't you like fray around the edges a little bit, you know, at least show a little bit of vulnerability or dismay, but it's not going to be that way. I think it's really often more from coming back to ourselves and our own experience and, and feeling what it's like when we are lost and or when we've been lost, maybe is more realistic because uh, it happens, right? And and how that was, and look at the consequences, even now, and whatever it might be, and you think, oh yeah, you know, it is kind of the same. Thank you. Excuse my voice right now. No. So we are going to open it up for questions. <laughs> you poor thing. Do you want water? This is your water, too. So please, um, and we have about um, 20 minutes and then Sharon's actually going to end with a guided meditation before we sign the books. So we could have people just come up to the mic if that's easier. Or, or pass, or it, pass around. it around maybe because... There's also, there are also no cards. If anyone wrote a question on a no card, you can hand it to me. There was some... Yeah. Thank you so much for coming. It is on, yes. Um, I've been thinking so many wonderful things, you know. Um, I, I got to hear you also last night, and I appreciated that so much. And uh, same thing this evening. Um, and so I, I want to ask you something. Um, and, and if you haven't seen this particular YouTube video, I'm, I'm just going to thank you one more time and have a seat. But have you by chance seen the videos on YouTube where people will get together in a large city, a uh, group of people, and they'll just spread blankets and sit down in a common uh, space and invite strangers to come and sit on the blanket with them and simply <coughs> stare into each other's eyes for a couple of minutes. Have you no, seen I haven't. Videos? What happens? Do people like weep? Or? Oh my gosh, it's so, it's so fantastic. I mean, that's all they're doing. They, they set up a little sign that simply explains, you know, just please sit down and stare into my eyes and I will stare, stare into your eyes. For a couple of minutes and the, the videos are professionally done and so beautiful but um, I have done this with a few of my friends that I already loved before we stared into each other's eyes but the um, the feeling was so incredibly powerful and moving and as much as I loved them before I loved them more deeply after these couple of minutes and can you, never even having seen the video, I mean, can you just hear what I'm saying mm -hmm. and speak to the power of that simple act? And I, I just mm -hmm. have these strange uh, feelings like, you know, something that simple that's right under our noses has such tremendous power to heal. Mm -hmm. So thanks again for coming to Charlotte. Yeah, thank you. Um, you know, it reminds me in a way of what it's like when people come together in silence, like on a retreat because the normal means of discourse are not there. And the normal way we might just feel, I have to present myself, you know, like I'm feeling awful, but I can't let them know. So I better act like I'm chipper and tell them a joke or, or you know, I've never met them, I better impress them or something like that. It has no place because we're not speaking. Um, so it reminded me of that a little bit. and. Uh, there's something so um, moving to us about actually getting there. That's why I asked if people cried. I think I once, uh, this is I think in the book, I was asleep um, and dreaming. And in the dream, somebody asked me, why do we love people? And in the dream, I responded by saying, because they see us. And then I woke up and I thought, that's a really good answer. <laughs> like, wow, <laughs> I'm impressed, you know. 
Uh, but it's true, you know, and those moments are really rare and, and precious. Like when I wrote um, Real Happiness at Work, you know, one of the things I was really uh, interested in was how often we meet somebody and the first question is, what do you do? You know, it's not, what's your favorite color? What made you happy today? What surprised you today? It's like, what do you do? Right, that's our identity, and that's what we present, and it's, you know, and then we judge it, and you know, whatever it is. But it's very different than just kind of seeing and being seen. So, I'll definitely look for those. Anybody know the name of those videos? Somebody in the room that surely seen them. No? Oh my gosh, you guys all need to look this up. <laughs> Thank you. Anyone else? Hi. Um, in the context of uh, family or people that are really close to you, uh, what is your vision of unconditional love in uh, dealing with uh, when it's not reciprocated to your own personal needs? Mm -hmm. um, uh, there are two things. One is I always try to make a distinction between opening one's heart and acting in a certain way. Because I think if we feel that love can only look one way, then we feel imprisoned. And we know there's such a thing as tough love. We know there's such a thing as fierce compassion. And we can use awareness and mindfulness to see, am I genuinely coming from a loving place? But I've had people ask me constantly, like unbelievable questions, like does coming from a place of love or, or generating more love for this person mean I have to go visit them in jail? Uh, or I have to let them move back in? I have to give them money so they can buy more drugs? You know, all kinds of things. And um, so we're not really talking about behavior, you know, and action. Those choices hopefully also come from a place of mindfulness, of context and um, skill and discernment. And we make mistakes for sure, but hopefully we can learn from our mistakes and, you know, have our action just informed by as much wisdom as possible. So that, I think, is an important distinction. The, the other thing, or another thing, is that in order to enhance that sense of love in one's heart, you know, wishing they could be free. I mean, I've had people, who, when we do loving kindness meditation, um, it's the silent repetition of certain phrases like, may you be happy, may you be peaceful, peaceful, which is like gift giving. It's offering. It's like you hand someone a birthday card, you say, may you have a happy birthday, may you have a great new year. And I've had people, who the only thing they could think they could genuinely say was maybe free of hatred, something like that. You know, so I think we need that flexibility also. And then the other thing I was going to say is I, you know, I was, um, uh, I often, when I can, co-teach with this friend of mine named Sylvia Borstein, who's uh, 81 or 82 at this point, and... Um, I'd be sitting next to her and one of her sayings was everybody's just doing the best that they can and I'd sit there thinking I don't think so <laughs> like I just don't think so you know like I could do a lot better you know like <laughs> and we're both New Yorkers but she's sort of another generation you know and uh but over and over again, she said, everyone's just doing the best they can. I go, oh. <laughs> and then one day, it really struck me, you know, she's right. <laughs> if they could do better, they would do better, you know, but there's such a thing as ignorance, and there's delusion, and there's belief, you know, around what's going to make us whole, what's going to make us happy, and, and sometimes it's crazy. So then I read a quotation from Maya Angelou who said something like, um, when you know better, you do better. <coughs> and I thought, okay, I can hear it that way, you know.
I have a question back here. Hi, um, thank you very much for coming here today. I really appreciate it. And um, I read something that you wrote where you said, I think I'm quoting this correctly, that forgiveness is a grieving process. And I was curious, and you actually just, what you just said kind of touched on it, um, how that fits in that forgiveness and reconciliation are very different, <coughs> but you can still be loving even if you choose not to reconcile. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, yeah, and actually there, there are interesting stories I felt I really try to crowdsource this book, you know, and hear um, people's stories and insights about love. And, and that was something that came out very strongly that um, you might really make tremendous movement in your heart so that you didn't feel so burdened or haunted by someone's actions. You really did feel free, but it wasn't in the cards to reconcile in the sense of spending time or um, you know, discussing that with somebody. And, and that was really striking to me. I think forgiveness is often a grieving process because the world is not the way we want it to be. And I would go so far as I don't think the world is the way it should be. Just, humane, kind. Uh, it exists, you know, for sure, in very powerful ways. But, you know, one of the things we say when we talk about equanimity, um, the kind of balance or wisdom that accompanies compassion is that I will do everything I can to try to help you, as one example, and it's not in my hands. This, is not, this world is not in my control. Your decisions are not in my control. And then I, I've said, um, if I were in charge of this universe, it would be a lot better a world. And someone in a, a group once challenged me and said, are you sure? And I said, I am really sure. <laughs> like, <laughs> but it's not so. It's never going to be so that I'm in control. And, and so there's that kind of letting go, which is like a kind of grieving and saying, yeah, you know, I can't make it so. I can't make you happy. I can't make you not have set on that course of action. Would that I could, but I can't. And we come out of that not desolate, you know, but I think we emerge um, in, in a much more balanced state about things and able to move on in some way. Hi, Sharon. Hi. Um, I was really um, struck by your description of the quivering of the heart as, as sort of a manifestation of empathy. And, um, and I was just wondering if you have um, contemplated ever the concept of meta in relation to nature, um, even to um, like a, a species or even to a single tree or anything to do with nature? <laughs> I have friends who would really laugh if they heard that question uh, because I am a real New Yorker. <laughs> um, uh, yes, I mean, uh, when we talk about belonging, you know, we talk about connection, and we talk about connection in um, a very real sense. We're talking about seeing ourselves as part of nature. Being a New Yorker, I used this other example last night, which I'll use now, but you could well substitute nature for that, which was um, the example I used was uh, driving around in a car with a friend of mine when we got stuck in this really terrible, hideous traffic and complained about it really bitterly. And then my friend said to me, well, we're the traffic too, you know? <laughs> and I thought, oh, right. <laughs> you know, we've been driving along like we own the roads. They're ours. We're the center of the universe after all. And all these people are in our way, you know, like get out of the way. And, and I realized, oh, they're thinking that about us. Now substitute nature for that. We think of nature as kind of exotica, you know, and uh, species that have nothing to do with us. But what about us as part of nature? Because it's true. Um, and, you know, in a, a strict Buddhist interpretation of loving kindness, you wouldn't 
there's a difference between, there's considered a difference between a sentient being and a non-sentient being, and you wouldn't necessarily offer loving kindness to a tree, for example. Um, but I always say, I think more loving kindness is better. And if you are moved to have that, you know, kind of resonance with, a tree or a mountain or whatever, like do it, you know, uh, because the world could use it, actually. Hi, thank you very much for coming. Sorry. Yes. <laughs> uh, I was curious, so I was raised or learned uh, through my upbringing the importance of achievement, uh, and it, it's led to a, a tiring life, if you will. And uh, fortunately, as I've aged, I, I'm, I'm realizing one doesn't have to follow that kind of life, but it's been a tough road to hoe. And mindfulness and the teachings of Buddha has really helped there as well. So I was curious if um, it feels like that kind of a life, and I'll use the phrase Western, um, white Anglo-Saxon Protestant work ethic um, to describe it, but uh, probably not a good appropriate phrase, but can you talk a little bit about how that gets in the way of loving kindness uh, to ourselves and to the world, and also how the <laughs> life uh, in Eastern in the Eastern world, and particularly in the times of the Buddha, uh, must have been different to allow him to come come upon this amazing uh, philosophy that he has? Well, you know, I think there's. Um there are really good things around being dedicated to a life of achievement in terms of energy and accomplishment and learning and things like that. I think part of our problem is that we get fixated and uh, we don't, we're not taught to look at the costs, you know, of what we are determined upon. So, I mean, this is not really the same thing, but it's an example that popped into my head. So, um, I don't really see the, the thing, the object in this room, but um, to, to base this on, but I was teaching once in New York City in this place called Tibet House, uh, which is actually an art gallery. And so they're always changing the exhibits in the program room. And I was doing this out loud meditation on grasping or greed. And um, I could see like a wall hanging sort of off in a corner. I couldn't see the, the price, but I could see the wall hanging. <coughs> So this is my out loud meditation, like, I want that. <laughs> you know, I've got, to, I've got to buy it. Okay, I'm going to buy it. And then I remembered at that point, I was living in like a teensy little sublet apartment, and I wasn't allowed to hang anything on the walls. So I looked at the wall hanging, and I said, okay, I'm getting a new apartment. <laughs> and while I get a new apartment, I'm going to get a bigger apartment. And that way I'll have a room and the wall hanging will have its own room and I get that lighting, it'll be really special. And then I realized, you know, for me to pay even more rent in New York City, it would mean I have to travel more and I have to teach more and I have to earn more money. So I basically would never be in New York. I'd never see my wall hanging, but I'd own it, right? So that's what we do, except we don't, we don't stop and think, what am I losing or compromising or in order to get this thing? So our choices aren't necessarily based on wisdom, but um, until we get older, which does help, actually. But, um, <laughs> you know, but more on, on some kind of unthinking, habitual uh, craving. And it's so conditioned. Um, that it's just, we just want to broaden our perspective so that when we make a choice, it's, it's based on a, a bigger perspective and understanding. There are lots of ways of defining success. Uh, I have a friend named George Mumford who's a uh, mindfulness coach, often with sports teams, although not only with sports teams, but that's what he's kind of known for. He, uh, he worked with the Chicago Bulls. He worked with the LA Lakers and more recently, he worked with the New York Knicks, which were not covered in glory in his years. And sometimes he has a book that came out called The Mindful Athlete. And we would, uh, when his book came out, we would do some things together sometimes in New York City. And someone always brought up the Knicks. And he said, my definition of success or achievement is not you compared to the other guy. It's you 
compared to your previous record? Like, are you continually growing and changing and doing better or whatever? And no one in the audience bought that, you know, because it was the Knicks and they were doing so badly. Um, but I, I thought, oh, that's interesting. You know, how do we define success? And why does it have to be just the one way? You know, maybe there are lots of ways we could look at life and, and uh, be creative in our, our sense of what meaning is or fulfillment is or what flourishing is. So we really can do that. You want to take one more? Yeah. Take one um, last question, and yeah, and then we'll do the meditation. Hi, Sharon. Hi. I'm intrigued by your, the notion of love as not just a feeling, but also an ability. And one thing I appreciate about that is that abilities can be cultivated. We can get better at that. Um, and I do feel that my practice, meditation practice, particularly loving kindness practices, have have enhanced that ability for me. And I'm wondering if you could talk about other ways that we can help that ability to flourish. Mm -hmm. uh, well, loving kindness practice is a really good way. <laughs> um, and I think, you know, mindfulness, whether you do it through meditation or you do it some other means, um, is a tremendous asset because if you look at all the assumptions that come up in our minds and how they just tend to distort relatedness, you know, what we see in front of us, um, and realize like, oh, if I can catch that more quickly and then kind of put it on the shelf to have a more genuine sense of connection, that's a really great thing because then we discover you know, instead of thinking, oh, that person was boring because someone else told us they found them boring. Pay attention. You know, maybe they're not so boring to you. Um, you know, th there's so much that can happen as we, we just hone that ability to pay attention. Um, and, pra you know, there's so many practices we can do that are kind of fun and creative uh, if you're continually paying attention to what comes up in your mind. So one of the things we say um, around uh, the Insight Meditation Society, for example, is, where there's a resident community, uh, we undertake these kind of disciplines, you know, uh, for fun on a temporary basis. So one is if you have a really strong impulse to give something away, not like a little dwippy, vague thing, but it, you know, it comes up strongly. I want to I offer that, I want to give it. And it's not gonna harm anybody. You know, it's not like I'm gonna give away everything and my family will have nothing or something. Um, if you have a strong intention arise to give something and it's not gonna harm anything, give it. Even though once you resolve on giving it, the next 50 thoughts are being fearful, you know, like, I don't think I should give away that book. I mean, it's close to the top of the pile. It's been four years <laughs> since I bought it. And it's just this feeling. It's the one thing I need to read. And then I'll be enlightened. It's just going to carry me right over. But I can't quite read it yet, you know. And, and yet, I don't think I should give it away because, you know, what if I need it next week? And it's not there. So you watch what it feels like when you have that sense of wanting to give. You watch what it feels like when you get afraid. You watch what it feels like when you give anyway. And you watch what it feels like after. Do you ever actually regret it? You know, and so it's almost like um, muscle training or something like that. And again, it's not punitive. It's not like saying I'm such a terrible miserly person or something like that. But it's really watching the play of, of how all these things feel. And then we remember, oh, you know, it didn't feel that good when I just said that about that other person behind their back or whatever. Joseph Goldstein has one he talks about sometimes. He did this, I think, when we were living in India. He said for a month, and that's the kind of thing, you know, it's just a time-limited thing. Um, he said for a month he decided he was not going to talk about any 
third person. Like if somebody wasn't there, he wasn't going to talk about them. And that if he had something to say about someone, he'd say it to them instead. And he said something like 95% of his speech was eliminated. <laughs> you know, it's just kind of interesting, you know. That's where I spend all my energy. Look at that, <laughs> you know. That's great. Thank you, Sharon. Thank you. So you're still up to yep. doing a practice. Great. We'll do a short practice together, OK? Thank you. I think since we don't have so much time, we'll go back to kind of the foundational exercises, which include something like resting our attention on the feeling of the breath. But I want you to really try to pay particular attention to the moment when you realize you've lost it. That it's been quite some time since you last felt a breath because that's the moment that's really crucial. That's the moment we have the chance to be really different. Usually we'll chastise ourselves and we'll feel like a failure and we'll you know, rail against ourselves and here we are, practicing letting go more gently and with a full heart and kindness toward ourselves, just bringing our attention back to the feeling of the breath. So I'll guide you through it. If you could sit comfortably, See if your back can be straight without being strained or overarched. You can close your eyes or not, however you feel most at ease. Let your attention settle into your body. See if you can find the place where your breath is strongest for you or clearest for you. The nostrils, the chest, or the abdomen. You find that place, bring your attention there and rest. See if you can feel one breath. Without concern for what's already gone by, without leaning forward for even the very next breath, just this one. And when you realize you've been gone, lost in thought, wrapped up in a fantasy, or you've fallen asleep, truly don't worry about it. That's the moment where the practice actually happens. See if you can let go and bring your attention back to the feeling of the breath.
So thank you. May you be well and happy, and may we meet again soon. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Sharon. Much love, much gratitude. Thank you. Really. Thank you for your time, your wisdom. I think you're the first person who brought me to Charlottesville, actually, all those years ago. Maybe. I think you were. Okay. So thank you. Thank you.